members. That concludes our statement. We're now going to move on to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion 14904 in the name of Christina McKelvey on Hear Me Too, 16 Days of Activism to End Violence Against Women and Girls. And I would invite members who wish to speak in this debate to press their request to speak, to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Minister, Christina McKelvey. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Violence against women and girls is one of the most devastating and fundamental violations of human rights. It has to stop and meaningful action must be taken to stop it. The 16 Days of Action is an opportunity for us to come together to give new momentum to our ambitions and also to review just how far we have come. It is being marked all across Scotland and I look forward to joining the many events over the next uh, 16 days. At the weekend, I was fortunate to attend an event that focused on the catalyst for this period, uh, the 16 days. On the 25th of November 1960, sisters Patria Minerva and Maria Teresa Mirabel, three political activists who actively opposed the cruelty and systematic violation of the Trujillo di dictatorship in the Dominican Republic, were clubbed to death and dumped at the bottom of a cliff by Trujillo's secret police. The Mirabel sisters became symbols of the feminist resistance and in commemoration of their deaths, the 25th of November was declared International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women in Latin America in 1980. This International Day was formally recognised by the United Nations in 1999. Today, presiding officer, the 16 days takes place annually to remember those who have been lost to gender-based violence and to commend the bravery and sacrifice of those activists who have striven to end violence against women and girls all over the world. This debate takes place at a time when violence against women and girls is very much in the spotlight. We have all been moved by the stories told through the Me Too movement, which has prompted thousands of women to disclose that they too have been victims of sexual harassment or assault. If Me Too has achieved anything, it is to give women the voice to stand up to everyday sexism, gender-based stereotypes, sexual harassment, glass ceiling, and the list, presiding officer, goes on and on. Behaviour that was once written off is, or tacitly ignored is finally being challenged and perpetrators are being held to account. Presiding officer, it would be remiss of me not to raise, given its proximity to today's debate, the trial in Cork, which caused controversy in the Irish Parliament when Ruth Coppinger, the MP, exhibited her outrage at the proposition that a woman's choice of what underwear she is wearing could imply whether she did or did not wish to have sex that evening. Victim blaming is an insidious problem and one which we, we must continue to address in our society every day and in every way. And let me be clear, presiding officer, in challenging such behaviour, this government, this parliament and this society have a responsibility to take action to end violence against women and girls. And to achieve success, we really must work together. Our Equally Safe strategy has a decisive focus on prevention, seeks to strengthen national and local collaboration, working to ensure effective interventions for victims and those at risk, and contains a clear ambition to strengthen the justice response to victims and perpetrators. Presiding officer, this time last year, we published a delivery plan to deliver the practical steps that will take us forward eh, towards ending this violence for good. The delivery plan sets out 118 actions and we intend to take these forward until 2021. We have already made progress in taking forward many of these actions, particularly in our approach to ensuring that our children have an understanding of important issues like consent and healthy relationships. We are expanding the Rape Crisis Scotland <coughs> Sexual Violence Prevention Programme to all 32 local authorities in Scotland and supporting Rape Crisis Scotland and Zero Tolerance in their Equally Safe at School project to develop a whole school approach to tackling gender-based violence. Earlier this year, I was thrilled to visit on the many occasions that I visit St John Ogilvie High School in my constituency and find students given an assembly on Equally Safe and next week I look forward to visiting Denny High School to see the work that they are doing in embedding equally safe principles throughout their institution. When I was in that school that day, I was reminded by one of the absolutely amazing young women delivering that project, um, one of the young activists, uh, of the Elizabeth Edwards quote. She stood in the storm and when the wind did not blow her away, she adjusted her sails. 
Presiding officer, the voices of our young children are important and our Everyday Heroes project made sure we listened to children and young people during the development of our delivery plan. I look forward to meeting some of those exceptional young people at the Everyday Heroes parliamentary reception next week. Our focus on education extends to our universities and colleges and I want to take this moment to mention Emily Druitt. Emily was an ambitious, promising 18-year-old in her first year at university. She took her own life. She was experiencing domestic abuse by her partner. This reminds us that no institution is immune from the scourge of gender-based violence. And we are working with universities and colleges to support them in using the learning from our Equally Safe and Further and Higher Education project at the University of Strathclyde to ensure the safety of students from gendered violence and embed better understanding of these issues in their curriculum. Yes, certainly. Jillian Smith. Thank you, President Officer, and I thank the Minister for taking an intervention. I wonder if she would comment on whether or not she thinks that more education is needed around the government position that prostitution and pornography are also on the spectrum of violence against women. Cab uh, Minister. Yeah, I would, I would agree with Elaine Smith on that point. And just this week, as part of the 16 days, I opened the Inside Outside um, exhibition at the University of West of Scotland, which was last week. It's now in um, at Kilmarnock this week. And I would urge members to get along to that and see the experiences of, of the, the women and the victims involved in that. But certainly, we will always be looking at the aspects of um, the, the gender-based violence relating to pro prostitution. So I would be uh, happy to hear more from Elaine Smith. I know she's campaigned in many years on this. But, President Officer, I wanted to take a, a pause uh, for a moment to pay tribute to Fiona Druitt, Emily's mother, who I believe is sitting in the gallery with us today. Fiona has campaigned, along with the National Union of Students, for universities to tackle these issues on campus and provide better support for students. Her contribution to this project has been and continues to be phenomenal. It is humbling to see Fiona and I believe her husband have managed to turn such a personal tragedy into a driving force for change. And I know that my ministerial colleagues and my officials and probably everybody across uh, the parliament uh, would like to um, express the fact that we've been inspired by their uh, personal campaign and continue to be inspired. Presiding officer, uh, aware, uh, raising awareness and embedding understanding of gender-based violence is important, but the bigger challenge is delivering on a societal shift where women no longer occupy a subordinate position to men. We need to make progress, advancing women's equality in a range of spaces, economic, civic, so social and cultural. And the work of the First Minister's National Advisory Council on Women and Girls is very important in this regard. And I look forward to hearing um, and seeing their first report early in the next year. But we also have to act in the here and now to ensure that those that experience violence and abuse get the help and the support that they need. Specialist third sector services play a vital role in providing that support, which is why we are providing three years funding for organisations to enable them to plan for the future. And can I put on record my personal tribute to all of the organisations that many of us will know who have continued to work and nevertheless persisted and ensuring that we get the right information in order to make the decisions we need to take here. I was, wish to make sure that that tribute is paid to those organisations today. Presiding officer, over £12 million from the equality budget is being invested this year to support services and tackle the underlying issue that create the conditions of violence. And recognising the significant demand rape crisis centres face uh, for their support services, their very valuable support services, I was pleased last month to announce additional funding of £1.5 million over the next three years to help centres better meet that demand. Presiding officer, there has been a significant amount of activity this year by government and partners, but I recognise there, there remains more to be done and we will continue to keep up this pace. So, over the next year, we will run a number of campaigns, including a major national campaign on sexual harassment and sexism to raise further awareness of the issue and encourage a change in behaviour and attitudes. We will work very closely with Zero Tolerance to organise a more in-depth event, looking at the role that the media can play in tackling violence against women and girls, because we all know the media has a very important role to play in shaping wider attitudes in society. 
And we have all seen the deeply unfortunate and, un and sometimes misogynistic coverage of women in our media, but we have also seen some truly excellent coverage where journalists have shone a spotlight on these issues. And I will be honoured to be speaking at tomorrow's Right to End Violence Against Women Awards, which celebrates the best of media reporting. And as I stand at the outset, the theme of this year's um, 16 days is end gender-based violence in the world of work. I know that this parliament has taken steps to tackle sexual harassment in this workplace, and that's very welcome. But I'm also pleased to inform the in-chamber that the Scottish Government is running its own internal campaign during the 16 days, which will involve a number of events to help raise awareness and send a clear message that harassment and abuse is never, ever acceptable. A clear rem reminder that it falls to all of us to take action in this area. So to conclude, President Officer, a lot has been achieved, but there is still so much more to be done, and we cannot rest until violence against women and girls is consigned to history. I want to end with another quote, this one from Emma Watson, the UN Women uh, Goodwill Ambassador, and she says, how can we affect change in the world when only half of it is invited or feel welcome to participate in the conversation? I urge all of us to act, actively participate in this conversation today Today in this chamber, tomorrow and on and on until we have ensured that every woman in Scotland lives free from violence. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Annie Wells to be followed by Rhoda Grant. Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. This will be the third year that I've spoken in the annual debate recognising 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. And every year, I'm reminded of the gra grave situations many women are faced with, both domestically and across the globe, simply because of their gender. The issue transcends borders and cultures. Today, it will unite us in the chamber as we condemn a global issue which has affected women and girls for far too long. For 16 days, from the 25th of November to the 10th of December, this campaign offers a unique opportunity to reflect, to reflect on how far we've come and how far we have to go when it comes to eradicating gender-based violence. And looking at the global context, the statistics are extremely alarming. One in three women worldwide experience gender-based violence. In 2012, almost half of all women who were victims of international, intentional homicide worldwide were killed by a partner or family member, compared to just 6% of male victims. And across the world, 71% of all human trafficking victims are women and girls. This year, the UN's Unite campaign focuses on the theme, Hear Me Too, the purpose of which is to unite women's rights networks across the world to stand together in solidarity with survivor advocates and human rights defenders. In line with this theme, it's right that I highlight the work the UK is doing in the global context. Last autumn, the UK government committed £12 million of funding to the UN Trust Fund to end violence against women, support that is expected to help around 750,000 women and girls over the next three years. And last week, the Department for International Development made the largest single investment ever to end FGM worldwide by 2030. A huge commitment from the UK government and one that puts violence against women and girls at the heart of international funding. Of course, the UK is not immune to gender-based violence and there is still a persistent problem to tackle at home. The Scottish Government's focus on violence in the workplace, of course, reminds us that many women remain subject to sexual harassment and assault in their everyday employment. And following the widespread sharing of sexual harassment stories in the wake of the Harvey Weinstein scandal last year, I think we are all shocked to learn the extent of the problem. A poll showed that half of British women and a fifth of men have been sexually harassed at work or a work or a place of study. And of these, 63% and 79% of victims respectively kept it to themselves. And most shockingly of all, one in 10 women had been sexually assaulted. Although far too many women and girls are affected by gender-based violence, I do believe events over the past year have instigated a major shift in attitude when it comes to being open and frank in debate. And I'm pleased to see a national convention taking place and to see the issues being given the attention it deserves. Even within the political environment alone, the impact of me the Me Too movement was huge. And as a way of sending out a strong message, we, so 
we saw a swift response from the Scottish Parliament when the issuing of anonymous surveys to all staff and the setting up of the culture of respect workshops. Sexual harassment and bullying and intimidation can of course take place in any public or private space and I want to make sure the conversation continues. Yes, absolutely. <coughs> Kezia Dugdale. I, I'd be grateful to hear whether Annie Wells thinks it's easier uh, to report now than it was a year ago if you've been subjected to sexual harassment. And secondly, whether she thinks the insecurity of work is a problem, so that you know, the less likely you are to have hours next week means the less likely you are to report because all the power lands in your boss's hands. Annie Wells. I thank Kezia Dugdale for that intervention. I do think it's easier to report now. I think people that I speak to are saying to me that they find it easier to report. I think we do still have a huge mountain to climb when it comes to the power being in the hands of a boss. Um, but that's something that we all can work on and we all should take forward. We are all employers in this parliament as well. Um, however, earlier in the year, I too met Fiona and Jermaine Druitt, the parents of Emily Druitt, who sadly took her own life after a campaign of abuse and violence from her boyfriend. And I too was proud to support the Emily Test campaign which called for increased funding for co colleges and universities to support students affected by gender-based violence. In schools, I'm pleased to see the delivery of the Rape Crisis Sexual Violence Prevention Programme will be expanded to all 32 local authorities to increase the understanding of consent and healthy relationships. These are positive steps that show momentum is building and things are changing. It does, however, go without saying that we still have a long way to go in other areas. Over 30,000 domestic abuse charges were dealt with by Scottish prosecutors in 2017-18. There were over 2,000 rapes or attempted rapes recorded by Police Scotland last year alone in Scotland. And between 2011 and 2014, nearly 200 women and girls were subject to forced marriages in Scotland between 2011 and 14. Increased reporting will of course have an impact on statistics, but these nonetheless are quite shocking statistics. There are a couple of areas I would like to bring focus to before closing. FGM is still far too prevalent a practice in the UK with around 170,000 women and girls having undergone the procedure in this country. We have seen further action taken south of the border and with that in mind, I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary when closing for an update on how they are progressing their programme for government commitment to put forward an FGM bill that will propose protection orders for women and girls at risk and statutory reporting guidance for professionals. And we've also seen renewed discussion around how victims of rape and sexual assault experience Scottish justice system with frequent delays, poor communication and a feeling of disengagement with the process cited as a commonly occurring issue. And can the Cabinet Secretary outline what action is being taken by this government to reform the system in order to help victims? To finish today, I'd again like to show my sincere support for this global campaign. Millions of women and girls find themselves in horrific situations, both here in the UK and across the world, many of which are too difficult to comprehend. This will never be an easy subject to talk about, but it is one I am know we will need to address for many years to come. So many barriers face women, not just violence. 16 Days of Activism is a great platform and starting point from which to highlight these issues but I hope to see many more debates throughout the parliamentary year that focus on the issues which blight in women and girls. Thank you. <clears throat> I call Roger Grant, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Um, this debate has become an annual occurrence, marking the 16 days of activism against violence against women. And I would agree with Annie Wells that we need to have many more debates throughout the year to, to work on this issue and make sure that we eradicate violence against women. <clears throat> in this debate, we often congratulate ourselves about the work the Parliament's done from the first committee bill piloted by Maureen McMillan, giving greater protection to victims to the latest bill legislating to make coercive control an offence. And sadly, we also debate what still needs to be done and shows us how we have come a long way, but yet we have a long way to go. Violence against women is not a problem for of a woman's problem. It's a problem of a minor, no, minority of men, and yet they seem able to define our society norms. 
Sexually motivated crime is rising, and while some of the reporting that we see now is historical, the trend is upwards, and this shows that there is a growing sense of entitlement on the part of some men to the right to have sex without consent. Sadly, many of our young people are getting much of their sex education from the internet, and this leads to that impression. Hardcore pornography influences how young people see sexual relationships and leads to a sense of entitlement and sexual violence. To counteract this, we have to ensure that children have access to high quality sex education, which includes education on respect and consent. And I too welcome the extension of the Rape Crisis Prevention Programme to all schools. But this is not just only for our schools, but for our parents and indeed for our society as a whole to tackle. We really need to try and make it hardcore pornography less accessible. And in this age of technology, it should not be difficult. Search engine companies and internet service providers must introduce protection, but so far they have faced no pressure to act. And I would ask the government to explore how they can bring their influence to bear on these companies to make them act. Secondly, I would like to speak about commercial sexual exploitation, something touched on by my colleague Elaine Smith. From phone chat lines to prostitution, it has been recognised as violence against women since our very first strategy, yet little has been done to discourage it. Indeed, austerity has driven women into commercial sexual exploitations. And exploitation cuts have had a greater impact on women and, uni and universal credit, the two-child cap and the rape clause have also meant that women are struggling to feed their families and therefore the choice is stark, lose your children or sell sex. And that's simply wrong. Philip Alston, as I mentioned by others, the UN Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, described our welfare system as something that could have been compiled by a group of misogynists in a room. And therefore, I appeal to the Scottish Government to use their powers to repeal the two-child cap and with it, the rape clause. Because this inequality in our welfare system breeds inequality in our society. But neither can we have an equal society where women are a commodity to be bought and sold because that encourages traffic and slavering, slavery. While our law makes it a crime to buy sex from someone who has been trafficked, we are yet to see anyone prosecuted for that. Prostitution damages health and it damages society. Those who are forced to resort to prostitution never leave unscathed. Many women and men in prostitution have been victims of child sex abuse or have been in care. People who have already been badly let down are then being used as commodities rather than supported. It's simply wrong, it must be tackled, and we must learn to do what the government is doing to make Scotland a place where buying sex is no longer acceptable. Much of the focus in violence against women has been on domestic abuse. And we have some of the best legislation in the world on, that, on this, but we need to go further. My casework tells me that abusers will stop at nothing to assert their control. An obvious target is children. We too often read in the newspapers about children being murdered by an abusive partner simply to attack their mother. And few of us can believe that anyone would go to those lengths, but it, ha it does happen, and far too often. However, more common is the use of access arrangements as a route to coercive control and abuse. And our family courts appear to have little understanding of domestic abuse, forcing abused partners to take part in mediation for, and granting access to the abusive partner. No abuser should have a right to see their children. Yet repeatedly, women are forced to send their children to an abusive partner and live in fear of what is going to happen to them while they're there. If they refuse, they're threatened with the loss of their own access and in some cases their liberty. And how cruel is that? The abusive partner often changes arrangements to exercise their control and they use that access to find out information about their victim, creating conflict and stress for the children. <coughs> they also find out where their children live and use that to further perpetrate abuse. If a parent is abusive, then their parent right, parental rights need to be removed until such time as they can prove to their ex-partner or indeed to the courts that they are no longer a threat. 
I know the government is looking at this, but we need legislation urgently as children are being damaged now. Children of an abusive relationship are damaged by that relationship. It affects their mental health and their self-esteem. Becoming vehicles for that abuse makes it so much worse and we need to protect them from this abuse and create safe homes for them to grow up in. We hear of the impact abuse adverse um, childhood experiences have on children and how that damages their life chance. This domestic abuse is an adverse childhood experience and the state needs to protect children from it. In conclusion, presiding officer, I hope we reach the day when this debate is all about celebrating the end of violence against women. But until then, we need to use it to raise awareness of concerns and prevail upon the government to act. John Finney, six minutes, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, I'd like to thank the various organisations who have provided briefings for today. And I'm delighted that uh, all the parties have come behind the, the Scottish Government motion because I think this is certainly something there should be consensus on. It, as others have said, it's become an annual event and uh, there's a danger we all say the same things and share the same frustrations. Uh, of course, it's not just 16 days, it's every day that's a, a, an issue to many people. So, um, you know, to try and put some positive news into the scheme of things, uh, I, I noted yesterday from Twitter that Scotland's prosecutors have begun training in preparation for the new domestic abuse legislation which is due to come into force next year. Now, that's a very positive step. My colleague, Rhoda Grant, talked about the, the aspect of psychological abuse and coercive control and behaviour that's included in that. And I think it's very important that there is the specialist training for that. Indeed, it's vital. I, I noticed, that, noticed that the Solicitor General talked about um, domestic abuse being unacceptable and saying, and I quote here, it goes to the heart and fabric of our society. It corrodes the fundamental values of respect and equality between genders. Well, of course, the big issue is that there's great inequality. Uh, it, it is gender-based violence we are talking about, and we're talking about uh, very much uh, historic and systemic and inherent uh, inequality. Now, people have touched on the, the statistics that were also out yesterday from the UN uh, about the number of women. An average of 137 women across the world are killed uh, by a partner or family member every day. That's a, a shocking statistic, and many will remember it's not that long since people considered that domestic violence was something that took place behind, private, behind closed doors in private. It was a private matter, and others have alluded to the question of victim blaming, and that's another uh, 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 very pernicious thing that was accused of the, the victims of... Um, uh, domestic abuse. Now, uh, training is vital, and, and in previous debates, uh, I make no apologies for mentioning it again, I'll spare them the name this time, but High Court judges aren't beyond making inappropriate comments and perpetrating further stereotypes. So, I would like to see judicial training compulsory rather than uh, um, just... Absolutely. Bob Doris. Thank you very much, Mr. Fisher. I think that's a really powerful and important point. I think from my constituents' caseload and experience, I would welcome that training being extended to sheriffs who are making quite delicate decisions in relation to child custody hearings and contact and access. John Finney. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the member makes an extremely valid point. Indeed, a lot of the decisions aren't made um, in, in criminal context. They're sometimes made in a civil context, and it's absolutely vital that that power dynamic is understood by those making the decisions. Um, the UN yesterday said violence against women and girls, a mark of shame in our society. Uh, and uh, uh, the White Ribbon Scotland, in retweeting that, said it was a failure of men to recognise the inherent equality and dignity of women and that it's trying to broader issues of power and control in societies. And I think that's very evident. Again, on a positive note, I, I commend Equally Safe, the, the Scottish Government report and a lot of the positive things that are in there, launching a major campaign on sexual harassment and sexism early 2019. That's very positive. Some things that are sometimes presented to the authorities as fairly innocuous. Uh, I, I was dealing with a constituent case where someone was being harassed by uh, the social media. And I have to say that initially the response from the police was, well, it's just one of these things. And uh, it's, it's now... Uh, uh, fortunately been taken very seriously and it's a matter that's been considered in the sheriff court. So actually understanding the different routes that people use to perpetrate their, their violence is important. And, and I think uh, the role of the media is another thing that's mentioned in the Equally Safe Strategy. 
And we all have this dilemma of whether we're highlighting bad practice. By highlighting it, we are indeed promoting it. And I think, you know, uh, we have to highlight the bad practice. I, I, again, the Scottish Government and COSLA support for Close the Gap, and I thank them for their briefing, I think is very, very important. Uh, a lot of women may look in their workplace as being a safe environment. The reality is we know that that's somewhere where they are harassed, and indeed they're there, there are statistics that show um, that there's three quarters of uh, victims have been targeted at, at their work. So it's important that we provide the wherewithal for people to provide the support. Um, and um, someone else talked on the, the implications of the benefit system and the, the disproportionate impact that that has on women and girls. Um, I think uh, the Justice Committee at the moment is looking at uh, vulnerable witnesses and the bar has, has, uh, approach whereby people aren't continually re-victimised by having their statement taken. We heard today of a victim of vile sexual crime who was uh, interviewed over 20 occasions. That in itself is a horrendous situation. So looking at creative ways where we can extend the existing provisions perhaps to including the victims of domestic violence so that uh, a statement is taken by commission um, and uh, that would be a positive step. I also want to commend the work of Police Scotland as I've done in previous years too and particularly one aspect of work that they've done very closely in collaboration with the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and it's not based in the central belt, it's actually based in Forfar, um, where they investigate um, historic perpetrators, people who have been serial offenders of, uh, of women. And I have to say, as people will know from the coverage of some of the court cases, there's been tremendous work done showing that these people have had multiple victims and heinous crimes have been committed. Uh, and uh, I think that's a very positive step. Of course, education is the key and everyone talks about education and there's a way to go. There's issues around human trafficking. There's issues around female genital mutilation. Um, uh, so to that extent, I'll conclude by uh, commending the fact that we're going to have a, a, a campaign running to, to raise awareness of coercive control and domestic abuse to con coincide with the implementation of the act. That's just one positive step, but we have a way to go. Thank you. Liam MacArthur, six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President of Stan Warmly. Uh, welcome this afternoon's debate and obviously confirmed Scottish Liberal Democrats' strong support for the Hear Me Too uh, campaign. Uh, I congratulate all those who are involved in that campaign uh, to end violence against women and girls uh, and thank them for the briefings that they and others have provided ahead of uh, this debate. There have been, as ever, questions about uh, why I focus on women and girls, not on men uh, and boys. And while it's undoubtedly the case that men and boys are affected by violence, you only need to uh, have a cursory glance at the statistics to see the compelling argument uh, about the gendered nature uh, of violence. I think Annie Wells set out a number of those statistics. Others worldwide, one in two women killed were killed by their partners or family in 2012, 10 times as high as the figure for, for men. Across the EU, 45 to 55 per cent of women have experienced sexual harassment since the age of 15. And in Scotland, 79 per cent of domestic abuse incidents uh, reported in 2014-15 had a female victim and a male perpetrator. So those and other figures uh, provided by a range of organisations paint the same picture, reinforce the same message. And it's also the under underlying principle uh, on which the equality, uh, Equally Safe Delivery Plan uh, is based, that women and girls are disproportionately affected by violence that stems from systemic gender inequality. And 12 months on, uh, we now have the first report on that delivery plan. It, I think, confirms that progress has been made in a number of areas, but I think also confirms we have a way to go uh, in other areas. As a member of the, the Justice Committee, like uh, John Finney, I acknowledge uh, what has been achieved through the recent Domestic Abuse Act recognising at last the effect that coercive and controlling behaviour can have. Abuse every bit as damaging, potentially even more long-lasting than physical violence. Recognising to the collateral and sometimes direct impact that uh, abuse has on children in a household or in a relationship. Uh, we now have the Vulnerable Witness Bill currently under consideration. Again, as John Finney reminded us, we've had strong support for the principles uh, again this morning, but also had real concerns uh, that it perhaps falls short uh, of what is needed, not just in protecting children and young people who are victims or witnesses in criminal trials, but how that may be extended uh, to other vulnerable witnesses, particularly in the area uh, of domestic 
abuse. And I was struck by the evidence from a survey recently of young people carried out by uh, Dr. Claire Horton and colleagues at Edinburgh University, which found that young survivors of abuse felt the justice system needs to be, quote, safer, quicker, less traumatic, that those providing services need trained to listen, believe, and respond appropriately. And that echoes the findings of Dr. Leslie Thompson QC's review, uh, review published last year of victim care in the justice system in Scotland. Dr. Thompson concluded, quote, victims often speak of feelings of re-victimization re or secondary victimization once they enter the criminal justice arena. In the course of this review, a victim of rape described the trial experience as worse than the crime itself. And that's simply, uh, that is deeply uh, troubling view that cannot uh, be right and shows that however far we've come we still have a long way to go in meeting the needs of women and girls and children more generally in our justice system. Leads me on to a final issue I wanted to, to highlight this afternoon that in relation to forensic uh, medical services. Uh, on the delivery of these services equally safe um, states the clear preference was for a multi-agency coordinated approach to help deliver the highest quality of person-centred person care, treatment and support, delivered as close as possible to the point of need. It goes on, the Scottish Government will consult on proposals uh, to, clarify, uh, to clarify in legislation the responsibility for forensic medical examinations to ensure that access to health care as well as forensic medical examination for victims of rape and sexual assault is an NHS priority and consistently provided for throughout Scotland. On the back of that report on national standards in, uh, in December 2017, it was clear that Orkney and Shetland fell well short of that aspiration. Too often victims of rape and sexual assault were required to get on a plane head south for that exa um, examination. Unsurprisingly, under those circumstances, evidence shows that women and girls have been reluctant to come forward with allegations. Now, I pay tribute to the work of Rape Crisis Orkney, in particular, in highlighting uh, those concerns. I pay tribute also to the former uh, Justice Secretary for taking those seriously uh, and acting uh, towards uh, and pressing for improvements. And I also pay tribute to NHS Scotland for responding positively. Progress is being made. We need to build capacity uh, through to, to, to make those services sustainable. And there's a strong interest locally and training uh, uh, to, to secure that will be key. And I welcome Hamza Youssef's uh, commitment to me last week to look at ways that training might be prov pro um, provided locally. And if that is not possible, uh, support for the costs uh, for travel and accommodation to make sure that that training uh, takes place. I hope NHS uh, Education Scotland will now step up uh, to the plate. It, I'm also painfully conscious that this will do nothing uh, for children and young people affected by rape or sexual assault uh, in, uh, in our islands, uh, for whom the experience is every bit, if not more, uh, traumatic. And I think that's an area where I will be happy to work with the Scottish Government to see where improvements uh, can be made. There is plenty, of course, still to do. As John Finney, I think, again, rightly reminded us, this is 16 days of action. But the objectives behind the Hear Me Too campaign uh, are, should be a year-round commitment from all of us uh, and more besides. In a week where figures show that 60,000 domestic abuse incidents have taken place in Scotland, any complacency should be uh, dispelled. It provides the clearest possible call for further collective an action towards ending violence against women and gir girls in Scotland and indeed worldwide. Thank you very much indeed. We now move to the open debate and speeches of six minutes, please. Rona Mackay, followed by Margaret Mitchell. Thank you, presiding officer. So here we are again debating the subject of how to protect women and girls against violence. I long for the day when we don't have to have a debate calling for an end to gender-based violence. But yesterday I saw the shocking facts that we've heard here in the chamber today that highlight precisely the reason why we have to do this. It's because throughout the world 137 women every day are killed by their partner or family member. Presiding officer, that is very hard to process. Violence against women is a fundamental violation of human rights and it has no place in our society. This year's theme, Hear Me Too, 16 Days of Activism to End Violence Against Women and Girls, follows on from the prominent media campaigns such as Me Too, which highlight the scale of sexual harassment in the workplace. However, new research from ACAS shows only one in four workers in the UK agree that international media coverage has helped improve their workplace culture and 60% feel better staff training is needed to reduce sexual harassment at work. As a co-convener of the cross-party group on men's violence against women and children, 
and a member of the Sexual Harassment Working Group in Parliament, I know how much focus and work has been done to improve this totally unacceptable situation. As we've heard from the Minister, the Scottish Government is investing significant sums to tackle it and has brought forward legislation on violence against women to hold perpetrators to account. This funding has been used to increase court capacity to reduce delays, inconvenience and stress for victims and their families, as well as to widen access to advocacy, support services and legal advice. We must also explore the expansion of programmes addressing the underlying causes of perpetrator behaviour, such as the Caledonian programme that works with men convicted of domestic abuse related offences and to help reduce reoffending. In February this year, the Parliament passed the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, which created a specific offence of domestic abuse previously dealt with under various existing laws. The legislation covers psychological and emotional abuse and coercive and controlling behaviour as well as physical attacks. The bill also introduced a statutory domestic abuse aggravator to ensure courts take domestic abuse into account when sentencing offenders and crucially the damage it causes children as, as Rhoda Grant outlined. It's vital that young survivors of abuse have a voice and the campaign Everyday Heroes, funded by the government and coordinated by Scot Scottish Women's Aid, Bernardo's Edinburgh University and the Scottish Youth Parliament are enabling them to do that. <coughs> Presiding officer, I'm in the early stages of a proposal to launch a member's bill to legislate for stalking protection orders, originally launched by my colleague Mary Goujon. It essentially means that the police could apply directly to the court for an order rather than the onus being on the victim who often feel vulnerable and nervous about taking civil action to get a non-harassment order and possibly at their own expense. The number of recorded offences of stalking has increased from 605 in 2012 to 13 to 1,372 in 2016 to 17, doubled. Stalking can have a severe and long-lasting impact on victims Yet the reporting rate for stalking harassment is low compared to other crimes. Women and girls experience a higher than average level of stalking and harassment. Around 1 in 10 16 to 24 year olds had experienced at least one type of stalking and harassment in the last 12 months. This figure increased to over 12% for 16 to 24 year old women. More than a third who had experienced stalking and harassment in the last 12 months also had experienced partner abuse in the same period. Presiding officer, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government is tackling the scourge of violence against women and girls head on. The equally safe strategy was in introduced to prevent all forms of violence against women and girls and focuses on increased priority upon primary prevention, stopping violence from happening in the first place. We're also funding the organisation Close the Gap, and I thank them too for their briefing. We have, they've developed an innovative and world-leading employer accreditation programme, e equally safe at work, to pilot with seven local councils from January to December next year. The pilot will support employers to improve their employment practice to address the barriers that women face at work. It will also enable employers to support employees who have experienced gender-based violence, including sexual harassment at work, towards creating an inclusive workplace culture that prevents violence against women because violence against women is a workplace issue. Evidence shows that three quarters of women experiencing, experiencing domestic abuse are targeted at work and perpetrators of domestic abuse and stalking often use workplace resources such as phones and emails to threaten, harass or abuse their current or former partner. Gender inequality is at the root of sexual harassment and we must address toxic male orientated workplace cultures undervaluation of women's work, lack of quality part-time flexible roles, along with harmful attitudes and stereotypes before any progress can be made on preventing violence against women in or outside the workplace. A government-funded programme within Scottish Women's Aid has been running a pilot project for the last two years on how to best assist women having experienced domestic abuse on their journey towards paid employment. The workplace must incorporate the needs of all women, including those who have survived violent relationships and want to rebuild their lives. That so many women and girls are suffering violence and intimidation for men throughout the world is incredibly distressing and shocking. Presiding officer, women and girls must thrive as equal citizens, socially, culturally, economically and politically. I want my granddaughters to work in a safe, happy environment and to be treated as equals at every level. We know that violence against women and girls is about the abuse of power perpetrated by cowardly inadequates. It's our duty to take whatever steps are needed to put an end to it. Thank you.
Margaret Mitchell, followed by Bob Doris. Sunday marked the start of the 16 days of activism to end violence against women as part of the Hear Me Too campaign. The background to this initiative dates back to 1979 when the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women was adopted by the UN General Assembly. Since 1981, women's rights activists have observed 25th November as the Day Against Gender-Based Violence to honour the three political activist sisters from the Dominican Republic who were brutally murdered in 1960. In 1991, the White Ribbon Campaign, which is a global movement of men and boys working to end male violence against women and girls, was formed by a group of pro-feminist men in London, Ontario. This was in response to the Ecole Polytechnique massacre of female students in 1989. Wearing a white ribbon is a personal pledge never to commit, condone or remain silent about violence against women. And for the last three years, men and everyone else in the Scottish Parliament have been urged to wear the white ribbon to mark 25th of November as International Day for the Eradication of Violence Against Women. On February um, 7, 2000, the General Assembly adopted a resolution designating 25th November as International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women and invited governments, international organisations, as well as NGOs to join together and organise activities designed to raise public awareness of the issue annually on that date. Despite this, violence against women and girls remains a pervasive problem worldwide. In global terms, there is still a long way to go. To tackle gender-based violence, given 49 countries currently have no laws protecting women from domestic violence, 37 countries worldwide still exempt rape perpetrators from prosecution if they are married to or eventually marry the victim. And according to the new data released by the United Nations Office of Drugs and Crime, an average of 137 women across the world are killed by a partner or family member every day. This report states intimate partner violence continues to take a disproportionately heavy toll on women, <laughs> with more than half of the 87,000 women killed in 2017 reported as dying at the hands of those closest to them. The national campaign organisation Zero Tolerance states that the oppression Oppression exists in various guises and that there are many forms of violence which remain poorly understood. Education is key to prevention and there's still much more to be done in schools to make both boys and girls aware that certain attitudes and behaviour towards women are unacceptable. The NUS Scotland research found one in five students suffer sexual violence or, harass or harassment in their first week at university. 14% of women students had experienced serious sexual violence, the majority carried out by fellow students. And only 4% reported it to their institution. Here I commend the University of the West of Scotland for its Standing Safe campaign launched in 2016, which highlights and seeks to address the issue of sexual violence on university and higher education campuses. It aims to engage students to reflect on and change the harmful attitudes that can underpin gender violence. Crucially, the campaign also suggests practical measures such as training for safe bystander intervention in and the provision of a toolkit to ensure that students know how to access support. Clearly, gender-based violence and violence against women can take many forms. And in closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, I want to highlight one particular aspect, namely human trafficking. The 2017 BBC Scotland documentary Humans for Sale showed the extent of women and girls trafficked as sex slaves and the extent of sham marriages as a way to facilitate the abuse and control over women and girls who 
who have been trafficked. Trafficked. Trafficking is a crime often exerted by organised crime groups and is a crime which regularly crosses borders. Less well understood is the fact it exists not just interstate but interstate as well. Despite, um, despite this, our, our presiding officer in 21st Scotland, it is a horrendous fact that vulnerable girls young vulnerable girls uh, are being groomed and then controlled for the purpose of prostitution. As the 2070 documentary revealed, this was particularly evident in the Govan Hill area of Glasgow and recently a group of Govan Hill men appeared at Glasgow Sheriff Court facing human trafficking charges. Quite simply, if it can happen there, it can happen anywhere in Scotland. I uh, don't think I have do I have time? If you wish to take it, I do Absolutely. have some spare time. Will the member James accept, Dornan. Yeah, will the member accept that the, the police said that there was no evidence of uh, uh, such child prostitution in Govan Hill just over the last couple of weeks? Margaret as Mitchell. far as I'm aware, then um, charges are still being pursued, but I'm happy to defer to the member if he knows something different. Presiding officer, if today's debate does nothing else, I hope it raises awareness of this fact and encourages the public to be vigilant and report their concerns about any such possible activity, secure in the knowledge that this information will be taken seriously and acted upon. Bob Doris, followed by Claudia Beamish. Um, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. As you know, from the 25th of November, International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, to the 10th of December, Human Rights Day, the 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign is a time to galvanise action to end violence against women and girls around the world. That global reach is vital, and Scotland's international reputation to developing a range of policies and supports for those who have experienced gender-based violence or at risk of it, it is strong and it is positive. However, much, much more needs to be done to ever move towards truly eliminating such violence always necessitates analysing what actions have worked well, what more needs to be done, and always asking, always asking what next. And we've heard much of that in the debate already this afternoon. However, culture change across our communities is required to make sure there is ever any prospect of a zero tolerance approach or acceptance of gender-based violence. That needs to happen right across every community in Scotland. Speeches in this chamber show a national resolve on such issues, yes. Legislation and action nationally and delivered locally eh, can be of significant help and assistance to those that have suffered gender-based violence. However, every day in the communities we all serve, gender-based violence still occurs. Fine words and legislation can show leadership in that national resolve, but it won't change the lived experience for too many women in communities we all represent. Uh, working on the ground with credibility is required to break a culture and cycle of gender-based violence. Indeed, in the sister debate to the one this afternoon held at around the same time last year, uh, I made similar comments and as you do in debates like this you commend local organisations who do exceptional jobs so commended the Women's Centre of Glasgow and Mary Hill who through the classes and support they offer empower many many women and families who need help support and assistance. I mentioned Glasgow Kelvin College who became the first accredited uh, college in Scotland uh, for White Ribbon Scotland and recently picked up a Green Gown Award for further work they've done in communities in relation to tackling gender-based violence and I can't recall if I mentioned that actually I was looking at the official report just before I started this speech but I didn't get time to finish it. I don't know if I mentioned Miss, Ms, Miss, Mrs, a social enterprise founded in 2013 to re-empower women and girls through self-development programmes uh, and a wellbeing hub. I've visited them and they all do exceptional jobs but I'm also conscious that's about female self-empowerment and part of any Me Too or Hear Me Too campaign has to be what men are doing to play their part in society in tackling that culture change, which is why when I became conscious, I made a similar speech before last year, I said this, I said I will organise, shape and support a number of events in the communities that I represent to which men can speak up in support of ending gender-based violence against women and girls. And I have to say, President Officer, I had no idea whatsoever I was going to do 
at that point. I said, I thought, oh, crikey, I better do something. Actually, we all should do something. Um, but I did ultimately work together with the Women's Centre of Glasgow, Glasgow Kelvin College, the, the amazing Davy Thompson from White Ribbon, Scotland, an association of British bookmakers in Scotland, and I should pay tribute to Doug Morrison from them, actually, in coming together uh, to bring 15 bookies in my constituency, all the William Hill Ladbrokes bookies in my constituency, to appoint a store champion who were trained at Kelvin College under the tutelage of Right White Ribbon Scotland and supported by the Women's Centre of Glasgow uh, to be champions to get the customers that come into those 15 bookies to sign that White Ribbon Scotland pledge, never to commit, condone or remain silent about violence against women. Uh, I have to say, I, I don't take any credit other than come up with an idea and other people have to make that happen. That's what happens when you're MSPs in this place. But the absolute credit has to go to the store champions who with sincerity and credibility, passion and enthusiasm got 750 men to sign that pledge during a week of action. I know the minister is involved in a very similar initiative just now and I wish her well in relation to that. And David Thompson could roll this out across Scotland if there were resources and capacity building available to, to make that happen. And I think it, it, it's not going to change the world, but it's a little small step that we can, we can all do. And of course, that means just now I have to set my challenge for what I'm going to do by this time next year. Um, but what I did want to do uh, this afternoon was uh, 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 mention the Women's Support Project of Glasgow. My apologies that uh, I haven't actually spoken to them before I, I mentioned them, but they're a feminist voluntary organisation that works to raise awareness uh, of the extent, causes and effect of male violence against women and for improved services for those affected by violence. The reason they came on my radar in preparation for this debate is because in Maryhill, Maryhill Borough Halls in my constituency, uh, they're hosting an event on the 12th of December um, in relation to the history behind the Glasgow system. Uh, a, a shameful time in our city, actually, which saw the collusion of church, local authorities, police and medical professions to enforce the social repression of women. The Glasgow system was set up in response to the city's growing concern about prostitution, sexually transmitted diseases and the so-called moral health of society. But in effect, young women were locked up for being single mums, for being socialists, for being mill girls, for being actresses, uh, and some of them sold sex for money, but they had not committed crimes, these young women. They had no recourse to justice. They had no right of appeal. And that flawed, uh, corrupt system ran until 1958 in my constituency at Lockburn House. Um, and it only ended when the young women rioted to demand better rights for themselves. Now, the event I mentioned that's going to tell that story in much more detail than I've got time for this afternoon, presiding officer, is because they wish to seek views to commit to have a commemoration space with a plaque to remember those women who were incarcerated, not just at Lockburn House, but at Lock Hospital and at Duke Street Prison also. That was only 1958. You must close, please. That was only 1958. So my commitment going forward from this debate, presiding officer, is not just to champion how men can do more in the year ahead, but to remember brave close. women, not just in the current Me Too movement, close, but historically have done all they can. Claudia Beamish, followed by Sandra White. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm sad and relieved in equal measure to speak in this debate in support of Hear Me Too, 16 days of activism to end violence against women and girls. This year's campaign, as we've heard, focuses on an end to gender-based violence in the world of work. I'm sad because this is still a major challenge, as we've heard already in this debate. And although relieved seems an odd word to use, I use it because I'm relieved that we are collectively working together um, far beyond this chamber to find solutions to gender-based violence. As a new co-convener of the cross-party group Men's Violence Against Women and Children with John Finney and Rona Mackay, Rona Mackay um, I'm very conscious of the responsibility and also the opportunities that that brings to help shape the future and to raise awareness of the continued social, economic and political inequality women face every day. At the last of these uh, CPGs, the Education uh, Cabinet Secretary John Swinney joined us and we listened to um, the very wise words of young women speaking um, of their experiences and solutions. 
and I was very heartened by, um, the, um, by the Cabinet Secretary's commitment to, uh, to work uh, with us uh, in the future and to have a further discussion on these issues. One of, the, uh, one of the issues that was raised was the absence of policies at board level in some uh, higher and um, further education institutions, which shows a real need for catch-up. Uh, the Cabinet Sec Secretary's offer of uh, discussion will be taken up. And uh, one of the things that I want to highlight today uh, is rural um, issues for women who experience domestic <coughs> violence. And I hear of challenges of women living in a more geographically uh, isolated places and discussing this with Scottish, uh, with, Sco um, with South Lanarkshire Women's Aid, it is clear that there are um, some additional challenges which we all need to work to address together. The pressures of rural living can leave an abusive partner with even more challenges beyond the obvious <laughs> and painful issues that all face. There are issues of anonymity of living in a small community, lack of support networks and general amenities, along with the logistical challenges of poor transport links and slow, unreliable internet connections, bringing further isolation. This year's focus on the world of work is a pertinent issue for women living in rural areas who are limited by the work available often in their communities, particularly if they're in low in on low incomes. They may face difficulties in looking for work with poor internet connections and often do not have access to regular reliable transport to get them to a job. This all conspires to restrict their ability to establish an independent life. Within my own region, the charity The Healthy Valleys has established the Lanarkshire Domestic Abuse Response Project, which provides a whole range of supports and also such things as complementary therapies to help improve the well-being of domestic abuse survivors. They help women also to regain control after ab an abusive relationship, like so many charities do across Scotland. Part of that control has to increase, of course, a woman's ability to cope independently, both emotionally and financially. And I stress that latter word. I would like to identify myself today with Rhoda Grant's comments on the shocking use of children um, in the context of, of any domestic violence uh, relationship. And I would also like to echo the call from the Chartered Institute of Housing Scotland in their briefing uh, to see detailed um, outlines in each council's local housing strategy on how they will support those leaving a domestic um, abuse, abusive relationship. This is necessary because those affected by domestic abuse and without the right support, of course, may find themselves homeless. And the potential loss of one's home is a significant consideration when considering leaving an abusive partner and the correct strategies have to be in place to support this. Um, with Scottish Labour, we've done something called the pause clause, which is also about uh, women uh, in, who are leaving uh, abusive relationships um, having the possibility of support um, to have their pets looked after or indeed to take their pets with them. This might seem like a small thing, but if it's yet one more thing that one has to face and the, the, the loss of a pet um, can, can be a, a big challenge. And the Dogs Trust actually has something which is a fostering service for six months. But the ideal would be is if um, women were able to keep their pets um, with them in, in a refuge and, and indeed in temporary accommodation. Um, I'm personally proud of being um, part of this parliament that has introduced legislation uh, which recognises coercive and controlling psychological abuse as well as um, physical abuse as a criminal offence. And we do have to face, though, that with, as others have said, uh, the, the figure announced today by the Chief Statistician for Scotland of 60,000 um, uh, people, women, sorry, um, uh, recorded by Police Scotland as being affected by domestic abuse in 2017 to 18. Uh, we have to face the fact that we have so much further to go on gender-based violence and what we have to do all together is to try to stop this scourge and part of that is making sure that we have an equal society. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Claudia Beamish. Can I say that I've been a wee bit lax over the first of the open debate speakers. 
um, and let you go on a wee bit too long. So have to be a bit stricter from now on. Up to six minutes, please. Uh, Sandra White, followed by Maurice Corey. Uh, thank you very much, presiding officer. Uh, many, and I mean many years ago, uh, I used to work along volunteer with Women's Aid in Renfrewshire. And when you were speaking to the women, and it's still the same today, they would say things like, um, I'm worthless. He told me it was my fault. And I always ask myself, and I did say to them, it is never the woman's fault. And we have to get that message across. It is never the woman's fault. But what I can't get my head round is why so much violence is perpetrated by men against women and girls of any age. And it's something, you know, we look at the legislation here, what we're debating, you know, 16 days of activism to end violence against women and girls. That is now 27 years old. Put forward in 1991, uh, you know, a campaign that was started then in Women's Global Leadership, and it's 27 years old. And like Claudia uh, Beamish, uh, I'm sad to have to talk about this, because basically it is still ongoing, 27 years. And the figures that's been quoted by John Finney and Rona Mackay, it's escalating. And yeah, I think the media has something to do with it as well, but there's obviously other things. And it says if you are constantly on the abusive end, you are worthless. And there's something sadly wrong with society that men think they can still perpetrate this violence. And that's why it's so important that we do debate to highlight the issues. We do debate it in this parliament. It goes out, and I ask the media, please put this out in the, the newspapers and other forms of media to let people know people out there throughout the world who are suffering this terrible, terrible violence that we here in this parliament and in others do care for you and are speaking up for you. And we are putting forward legislation to protect you. And it goes further than just this parliament. It goes, and I know Margaret Mitchell is in the CPA, and we have discussed this when I was a member of the CPA as well. It goes further right into the Commonwealth countries. And we can give that message across that we will not tolerate violence against women. But I wanted to mention that first of all, but I do want to talk to some of the, the motion in regards to that, and in particular the strategy, which is mentioned in the Scottish Government, the equally safe strategy uh, to prevent and eradicate all forms of violence against women and girls. And I do welcome the first progress report that's been put out from Equally Safe, and it does show significant activity there, and others have mentioned it, and also progress. And I know the Minister mentioned the total of 118 action points, but the 118 action points are, are in under four priority areas. And I think these are really important, ensuring that Scottish society embraces equality and mutual respect, rejects violence, that women and girls thrive as equal citizens, that interventions are early, and that's something I'll come on to later on, effective and maximise the safety of women, children, and young people, and that men desist from violence and perpetrators receive a robust and effective response. And that's when I have to agree with John Finney and Bob Doris in regards to the justice system. Uh, the justice system, when I, you know, constituents come to me, sometimes there's a real barrier there. And okay, when we, we talk to the justice system and we phone up property officials, et cetera, et cetera, yeah, they're dealing with the law. But they've got to remember, and they've got to get training, they've got to remember it may be the law, but they're actually dealing with real people. And they have to understand that. So I'm glad that they are going through training, but I think it has to be uh, even bigger th than that as well. So I do agree in that respect. Now, one of the other issues that uh, I think the Minister raised as well uh, was the event which I am hosting, <laughs> actually, the Everyday Heroes event on Thursday afternoon at lunchtime. And I do look forward to welcoming the Minister to that. And I know that Rona Mackay had mentioned it also. Now, the Everyday Heroes one, uh, the event celebrates the contribution of everybody, Everyday Heroes to Equality Safe Campaigning. It brings together children and young people from across Scotland and the team behind the project, which has already been mentioned by others. And the, uh, the programme was designed and coordinated by Equally Safe Participation and Partnership, young adult experts from the University of Edinburgh, Impact uh, Project, Bernardo Scotland, which I work very, very closely with, as others do, Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis, and the Scottish Youth Parliament. And it was funded by the government, which I think is absolutely fantastic. Now, the, the amount of people, and I have to thank the people who actually were involved in it, 
125 children and young people took part in the sessions, 17 organisations took part, and 439 young people took part in the survey. That's quite a huge amount. And it went across all of the 32 local authorities. And all of, some of the issues were uh, services to protect young abuse survivors, uh, tackling gender inequality and social attitudes, which is a huge one as well, improve the education responses, and ensure that participation from the people, and it's already been mentioned, who were directly affected is actually listened to and looked at. And I think that is a very, very worth, worthwhile event. And I welcome everyone to come along, Committee Room 1, on Thursday at half past one to quarter past two. So I look forward to that event, and I think it shows the amount of work the Scottish Government is doing in, in participating with the wider community. Now, in conclusion, presiding officer, if this debate alone highlights the very real abuse uh, in all forms that women and girls are subjected to throughout the world, uh, it will be a positive step and I do welcome it. Thank you very much. I call Maurice Corrie, followed by James Dornan. Uh, th <coughs> thank you, Deputy Resigning Officer. I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak today in this debate on such a critical issue. Violence against women and girls is inexcusable and should never be condoned. It cannot have a place in our society or any corner of communities worldwide. And we know that any women uh, can be the target of violence regardless of their wealth, status in society or the culture they are immersed in. The weapons of intimidation and manipulation are often the subtle beginnings of emotional and physical abuse. It can take the form of violence such as sexual exploitation, domestic abuse, harassment, female genital mutilation, or FGM for short, this abuse can so often result in overwhelming fe feelings of stigma and shame for women and girls. This cannot be allowed to continue. And over the past year, we've seen an outpouring of cases centering around sexual harassment and violence against women. These cases have brought to the fore the dizzy dizzying extent of the problem and the underlying attitudes that fuel it. I, along with my colleagues, fully welcome the rising visibility of these awareness campaigns. And they have kick-started a momentum that we must utilize. And these 16 days of activism against gender-based violence are not just simply to raise awareness. They are here to propel us to action and to necessary change. Prevention here is the cure and the key. In our policies, in our workplaces, in our schools, and in our communities as a whole. And preventative measures must be in place to radically alter the imbalance between men and women and the consequences that it has on their safety. And violence against women and girls is not just a problem for war-torn countries or nations where there are human rights violations. In these circumstances, it is often too easy for us to ignore the problem and subconsciously decide that the geographical distance means we don't have to care as much. But Scotland, along with the UK, should assert itself as an active leader in helping these countries where women and girls face particularly extreme forms of violence. And if we look at violence against women and girls, it is also a daily occurrence here, happening right on our doorstep. To fully support victims and survivors of sexual abuse, not just in Scotland, but also worldwide, we need to try harder to make sure it cannot happen in the first place. So while there is clearly a worldwide issue with gender-based violence in Scotland, we also see its presence and worrying consequences. Indeed, domestic violence must, only, must often occur in the victims' homes, is becoming an increasing problem. Forced marriages that take place in Scotland, often arranged for teenage young girls, is another issue which we cannot afford to ignore. And furthermore, the record of rape crimes numbered over 2,000 last year, and the true scale of FGM instances is thought to be much higher than we realize, as my colleague Annie Wells has highlighted already. We can see that steps taken by the UK government to tackle FGM head-on, with more imposing legislation and greater support for victims, including lifelong anonymity. I hope that the Scottish Government will take these plans into consideration and follow through to see what Scotland can contribute uh, in ending this terrible and degrading form of violence. Workplace harassment acts as a particular barrier to women. What is especially dangerous is that these inequalities can continue due to the fear of losing a job or being wrongly held accountable for the crime. Often reporting a harassment claim can be a laborious and also frustrating process. This has a damaging effect on working women and our workplaces must be safe spaces to work in, free from male orientated culture that encourages gender inequality and harmful barriers for women. And to see these commitments made so far by our Scottish and UK governments has been encouraging to say the least. 
Ensuring there is adequate training for employers and employees will tackle the stereotypes that often exist under the radar in our workplaces. Securing sexual violence prevention programs will help to inform our, our understanding of accountability and respect. And encouraging ample support for women and girls will undoubtedly impact their protection and create opportunities within their schools, homes and workplaces. What can we do? We can offer our support to both the Scottish and UK governments in their efforts to earn violence for women and girls, not just in our own countries, but nations overseas. And furthermore, we must ensure our police force in Scotland do receive and does receive the appropriate training for dealing with this type of violence. I asked the previous Cabinet Secretary in a debate previously to implement um, this on particularly in relation to domestic abuse. And very recently, uh, it has been announced on the 23rd of November that the Foreign Office has boosted funding to prevent sexual violence and conflict. The extra support will be used to boost the number of expert deployments by the Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative team of experts supporting efforts in places such as Syria, Burma and Nigeria. The team of experts will support governments. Yes, you will. Uh, John Finney, please. Thank you. I I'm grateful for the member taking an intervention. And, and in the spirit of consensus, I, I, I let two or three previous comments passed. I wonder if the member would care to reflect that the UK government's willingness to return women to these countries is indicative of showing support for women generally. Maurice Corrie, you're in your last minute. I think one has to be very careful in prejudging anything here, and in each case it must be looked at individually, and therefore one cannot make a general statement, uh, Mr Finney, over to what, how they are dealt with. Uh, each has its own particular cases to answer for. <coughs> And to conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I hope we can further our commitment and see the delivery of promises made to actively tackle violence against women and girls, both here and in Scotland and internationally, and particularly in my role as the male champion for women, representing this Parliament's Commonwealth Parliamentary Association, I commend this to the House. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call James Dornan to be followed by Kezia Dugdale. Mr Dornan, please. Quick girls, pop your coat and shoes on and get tucked up in bed and sister a young mother. But ma'am, it's not cold, why do I need to wear shoes in bed? Replies some very weary child. The mother sighs, prepared to tell another lie to her three young daughters because it's to get cold during the night is the meek reply. Now this conversation sounds like a snippet from a Victorian novel, but sadly this is a very real story of a Scottish woman in Glasgow. A woman had to put her daughters to bed in their jackets and shoes because more often than not, their father would return from the pub ready to beat his downtrodden wife who would in turn have to grab her beautiful girls in the night and flee from the terror. Now, as a man, I'm often asked why I speak so often in debates about violence against women. And the answer is simple, because it's men are the problem. This is a problem facing women, but it's one that's committed by men. And often when I share my thoughts on gender-based violence, I get a flurry of replies from men who state that women can be abusive too, and I'm not disagreeing with that. It would also be correct to say that violence can occur in same-sex relationships. However, we've already heard the statistics. In 2016-17, for example, of the gender-based crimes recorded, 80% were against women. If things are going to improve, they won't be improved by women changing their behaviour, but by men changing theirs. And I'd like to take a moment to remind any man listening to my speech that the following is not acceptable. It's not okay to ever lay your hand on a woman for any reason. There is nothing which permits that. Nothing. There's no reason on this earth why we should allow a man to force himself on a woman sexually. What a man is wearing is never an invite to touch her in any way, shape or form. And if you're told no, no means no. Verbal and mental abuse is now a crime. And that is one of the great achievements of the Scottish Government. Controlling a woman with her emotions, children or finances is also a crime and will not be tolerated. And when a woman walks out your life, allow her to do so with dignity. Stalking and controlling behaviour will also not be accepted. And once again, this is a crime. I, I was delighted to hear the minister mention my, my constituents and people that I, I like to think have become very close to the, the Druids, uh, Fiona and Germaine, and the story, the tragic story of their, their beautiful and much loved daughter, Emily. Uh, they have been the driving force for many of us uh, through this period, and it's been very sad, but it's been sort of, it's been a, a very powerful thing to see how strong they are and how they have determined to make something good from such a horrible tragedy. But there's other stories. And yesterday I attended the AGM of Waves in Casimalt, a magnificent group of women who have suffered from the curse of domestic violence. 
From that meeting came the following harrowing story of one of the brave women who have used the services of both waves in the DAISY project. This woman has come forward to share her story anonymously with this chamber and the people of Scotland to assure women never have to go through what she faced. For the sake of anonymity, we'll call her Lady. Lady was in care for most of her life and at age 16 met a man 13 years her senior, as so many in care often do. Lady began a relationship with this man, was subsequently removed from care by social work. This sort plunged into the murky world of his alcohol and drug addiction. He started to abuse her physically, mentally, and sexually. He would beat her and rape her, and she would be passed around to his friends to be used in a sexual manner. With no money and nowhere to go, Lady remained in this relationship for three years. She started a job in Glasgow and met a man, her boss, who would reward her good work and her employment with drinks. Lady's former partner would often come to her work and threaten her until he was arrested. The relationship started to go downhill when both she and her partner were sacked as it was seen as an inappropriate relationship by their employers. Her partner took to alcohol and that's when the beatings began, not only from himself, but he'd allow his teenage son to beat her too. Lady was able to escape to homeless unit and restart her life, but as he had controlled her money, life and relationships, she felt like and was treated like a non-person. Starting from scratch, she again started a new relationship and had a son who was severely ill. This partner also abused her as her subsequent partners. What struck me was that the father of her son, who was merciless in his abuse and spent time in jail because of it, was, in later years, awarded visitation of his son, which not only deeply traumatised Lady, but had a deeply damaging effect on her child. And she insisted that the visitation was just a new way to torture her. And when he grew tired of that, he grew tired of her son, and the visit stopped leaving, so the visit stopped leaving her son feeling abandoned. And I've got to tell you that in subsequent relationship, this brave woman has been arrested on a domestic abuse charge, even though she was, and witness testified to the fact, the victim. She was told, we have to take you both, that's the law. Now, I'm hoping things have changed to ensure that no officer would ever behave like that again. So, presiding officer, in supporting this motion, I support the brave women who have said enough is enough. The woman my story is now working with other survivors, and thanks to the reports, support she received and her internal strength, she is striving. I asked her if she had a message for the perpetrators in her story, and she simply said, I would say to them, thank you for allowing me to see that I'm better and stronger than you thought I could be. And it's for women like this and the many others that I'm grateful for the opportunity to speak in this debate. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll call Kezia Dugdale to be followed by Claire Adams. And Ms Dugdale, please. Thank you, President Officer, and can I start by commending James Dornan on what I thought was an excellent speech, uh, raw and honest, difficult to listen to in parts, and I know that it's one of many occasions where he's spoken with real leadership on this issue, and I would encourage him to continue to do so. Can I also thank uh, all the organisations who've provided briefings for today uh, for the tireless work that they do week in, week out, fighting for gender equality, knowing that that's the route to the eradication of violence against women and girls. And as has been said, we know the theme of this year's occasion is women in the workplace with a particular focus on sexual harassment. And to be honest, I find that utterly depressing. We fought so hard for so long to improve women's access to employment, through access to education and skills, to childcare, to financial independence, maternity and paternity leave, equal pay and so on. Women's participation in the labour market has increased as a consequence Although granted, they're still more likely to work part-time and get a lower wage than their male counterparts. And now that they are a major part of the country's workforce, they have to contend with misogyny and harassment and even assault in their workplace. Me Too transcends workplaces across the globe. From Hollywood to Holyrood, nowhere was immune, including our own place of work. Presiding officer, I don't think it's been a particularly proud year for us here as employers. Whilst we took the lead and conducted a brave survey of all staff, the results were stark. Those officials in the parliament and indeed the presiding officer himself deserve credit for the leadership they demonstrated and continue to show. However, our response to Me Too comes in two parts, promoting a culture of respect and creating a safe reporting environment. I'm very proud of the work the parliament is doing to create a culture of respect. However, there is a distance to go on creating a safe reporting environment. If we were truly honest with ourselves, I suspect we'd admit that a woman who's been sexually harassed in this place 
would be less likely to come forward now than she was a year ago. In fairness, I think she might be more likely to do so anonymously, but given policies here and the world over require victims to share their identity for a fulsome procedure to kick in, I think fewer women would do that now, fully knowing the consequences and the experiences of others. The personal and professional risks are still far too high for women. It's better to stay quiet and keep your head down, as women have done for decades, as women have done for centuries. In one high profile example here in the Parliament, presiding officer, both the victim and the perpetrator spent a period of time away from this building during the investigation. One is back at work, the other has left for alternative employment. And of course, it's the woman who is no longer here. That for me represents a failure of the procedures. When a victim feels that they can no longer work in a building with several hundred employees for fear of seeing someone in a lift or finding themselves alone with them in a corridor, then we still have a long way to go, despite the heroic efforts of the officials involved, who I know want nothing more than a safe and inclusive environment for all staff. I actually don't think we'll make proper progress with workplace harassment until someone, somewhere, develops an anonymous reporting mechanism which incorporates the appropriate safeguards. I'd like to see a model where women can anonymously report incidents and perpetrators, knowing that they will only be contacted again if, say, four or five other women report similar behaviour by the same man. A procedure would then allow them to pursue it collectively and formally on a class action basis. Strength in numbers. Like the Callisto model being pioneered on university campuses across the United States. It's bold and controversial, but what we currently do, in my view, continues to let women down more often than not. If we're failing women here, in the National Parliament of Scotland, what's it like in normal workplaces across the country? because we are kidding ourselves if we consider this a normal workplace. There are women across Scotland just now having to live with their boss's banter to make sure they can get a fair share of shifts next week, expecting a squeeze at the Christmas party because that's just what happens, being ordered to wear a short skirt in their bar job because that's what the customers like. Do it or be marked down as difficult spending an hour's wage on a taxi home because there are no buses and it's not considered safe to walk home in their own town. I wish we weren't having this debate. I wish the theme of this year's 16 days of action was sexual and reproductive health so that we could talk about how that's holding women back across the globe. From the HIV epidemic in Africa to the lack of abortion rights for women in Northern Ireland to the trouble poor women here in Scotland have accessing reliable contraception. There's a lot to talk about. The challenges of women everywhere to exercise choice and power over their own bodies. Yet still we're left talking about the actions of some men because they just can't help themselves. I'd like to see the Scottish Government use some of its social advertising budget on a national campaign against sexual harassment. But I want it to be bold and instead of portraying powerful men exercising power over supposedly weak women, I want to see a focus on the weaknesses of men who act this way and the weak men that stand by them. A real focus on men as bystanders who know their mates' actions are not okay but don't want to be the ones to speak up and speak out. Something they demand of women without a hint of irony. I put this idea to the last cabinet secretary and I hope she'll consider it today. In conclusion, there can be no end to violence without full gender equality, which is why the pursuit of that is and must remain central to all of our work. Thank you. I call Claire Adamson, who followed by Alison Harris. Ms. Adamson, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, uh, like many of the speakers this afternoon, I too um, are very sad that we're having to discuss this issue in the Parliament. And uh, following on from so many powerful speeches, um, very different and, and raising in different areas. It is it's difficult to, to find what I, ca I can possibly add to that. Um, I put my education hat on as convener of the Education Skills Committee and decided I would look at some of the issues 
around um, our colleges and universities. Um, and so I, I, was, I didn't know the Drew family were going to be here today, but I would also like to commend them on their tenacity and their humanity, which has driven them. It's a testament of their love for Emily that they have worked so tirelessly to improve the situation for students in our colleges and campuses in Scotland. I can't help but feel if the general population shared that humanity, then we may well not be having to discuss such issues in the future, and I hope for that day. I'd like to thank NUS Scotland for providing the briefing that they have for today. Um, and I, I, I was contrasting, when, it, when I read the briefing, I thought I would have a little look at what was happening elsewhere in the world and um, the, the area that I, I chose, probably because I was listening to um, a, another issue about racial discrimination in colleges in the US on the radio last night to look at the situation in the United States. And um, the research that they have is quite harrowing. One in four female students reporting unwanted sexual behaviour during their studies. One in five experienced sexual harassment during their first week of term. And the research showed that 14% of women students had experienced sexual violence. In the US, one, point one in five women are reporting it. Most women experience it in the, the very early stages of the university and they report 15%. The US also has um, evidence to show the LBGTI community is more adversely affected by this and also that um, they suspect that one in five offences is underreported in the context of colleges and, and universities. So the NHS have been working and they're looking for clear codes of conduct and a zero tolerance approach to this area and to and they're also asking for training for staff in dealing with and recognising such behaviours. Through this campaigning, the partnership work they have had with the Scottish Government has, has been noted and the Equally Safe in Higher Education Tools Kit, which has been funded by the Scottish Government, was released in 2018. And as it provided a framework for universities to work in partnership to evaluate, improve their policies and practices and eradicating uh, to, to work towards eradicating gender-based violence and the government have announced a further £396 million in funding to create a toolkit, th sorry, £396,000 million in funding to create a toolkit for further education to support the implementation of equally safe toolkits. <laughs> and I think um, I was reflecting actually um, when I was thinking about Emily earlier on about my own experiences at university and thankfully not having lived in the same climate as Emily, not having, you know, lived in the, the area of, of multimedia, of um, mobile phones even, or, or um, uh, Twitter and Facebook and the social media aspects of that. It was, it was a different time. Um, and I remember in 1988, Tracy Chapman releasing her uh, debut album with a, a very pertinent song called Behind the Wall. It was a, a sort of um, desperate and hopeless uh, story of a very jaded neighbour who hears domestic violence. But, um, and the quote from that is, I won't do, no, won't do no good to call. The police always come late if they come at all. And I think it, it was very challenging at the time because um, it was not something that people expected from a song, despite the fact that she's a political um, folk activist. But um, also that um, it, it really challenged all sorts of behaviour, um, the attitude of the police, the attitude of neighbours, the attitude of society about keeping things behind closed doors. And it, it was very moving at the time. And I, I was thinking about whether, um, that was 30 years ago for me, whether things had actually moved on. And, and I think to a certain extent they have. Um, I think the Equally Safe strategy has done a lot to prevent and eradicate violence against women and girls. And it's the, the violent and abusive behaviour directed at women and girls because, pre, just because of their gender. It's pr predominantly carried out by men and often stems from systemic, deep-rooted women's inequality, as mentioned by Kezia Dugdale, and which includes domestic abuse, rape, sexual assault and commercial exploitation. And we have to consider that sometimes I don't think that society does recognise all these, all these areas. And we've talked, there's a lot talked about financial abuse, coercive control, human trafficking, all of those things have been mentioned. 
Um, and Maurice Corrie just slightly touched on the use of rape as a weapon. And I know Kezia Dugdale has visited Srebrenica and has seen that. And also, um, I, considering the Holodomor, another uh, example where starvation was used as a weapon and it was a violence against the women and children in the Ukraine. So I think we have to recognise all these areas and work together and keep working together. It's not enough to hear what's going on in the next room. We have to take, so those ha hash hash hear me too, it's, we have to hear and take the action. Thank you, President. Thank you very much. I call Alison Harris to follow by Angela Constance. And Ms Constance will be the last speaker in the open debate. Ms Harris, please. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Today we've heard members speak about the 16 Days campaign, which takes place between the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women on the 25th of November and the Human Rights Day on the 10th of December, all in the spirit of reducing and eliminating violence against women and girls. Over the past 20 years, the campaign has been responsible for over 5,000 projects in 187 countries. Each one has contributed to supporting millions of survivors of gender-based violence in places all over the world. The, mo the motion title refers to the UN's Hear Me Too campaign, but I'm going to focus on the 16 Days campaign referred to in the body of the motion. Each year, the 16 Days of Activism campaign focuses on a particular theme. Recently, this has been on ending gender-based violence in education, from pupils to parents to teachers. This year, the theme is focused on the workplace. Gender-based violence in the world of work can take several forms, including the action or threat of physical or verbal violence, psychological or financial bullying, and sexual harassment or sexist comments. It is considered gender-based if it is directed against someone because of their gender, or if it disproportionately affects a particular gender. The International Labour Rights Forum has said that gender-based violence creates a significant hurdle for women to realise their collective bargaining power and ability to have a voice and seek equal treatment. And it can cause several mental effects too, meaning victims may not want to come to work and they may not have the confidence to push forward in their careers. In some parts of the world, serious and physical gender-based violence happens in the workplace all too frequently. With the, gender, with, the, sorry, with the garment making industries in several Asian countries witnessing employers hiring thugs to intimidate or conduct violence against women who join a union or speak up about their working conditions. Here in Scotland, we thankfully do not face this intensity of gender based violence. However, the other forms can be very damaging, and these have been rightly put under the spotlight over the last couple of years. I think it's fair to say that most common forms of gender-based violence in the workplace here are verbal abuse, sexist remarks and sexual harassment. Sexual harassment can happen in all kinds of workplaces and at any level and has been shown in the high profile cases in the last couple of years from Hollywood to Hollywood as Kezia Dug Dugdale previously said in her speech. It is usually experienced by women and perpetrated by men but it can also be the other way around and may involve people of the same gender. It can be difficult to know what to do about it, especially if your job or prospects are being threatened. You may worry that you will not be taken seriously or that speaking out has negative consequences. <coughs> Steps have been taken here in the Scottish Parliament and throughout the UK to address the culture that has allowed these incidents to occur. From zero po tolerance policies to creating safe and secure channels for victims to come forward. Recently, domestic abuse has been considered by campaigners as an aspect of workplace gender-based violence because of the effects the abuse can run into the work and affect the victim's ability to perform their job and interact with colleagues. In the US in 2017, around 97% of employed domestic violence victims experienced problems at work because of their abuse at home. In the Scottish Parliament this year, we passed the Domestic Abuse Act which contained measures to create a new offence that treats behaviour that causes psychological or emotional damage, such as coercive and controlling behaviour, as a punishable offence. This is a step forward for criminalising and reducing gender-based violence. However, we should always be thinking about what more we could do. Many argue that the bystander culture has played a significant role in allowing many workplace incidents to happen. And this in many ways comes down to people's attitudes. 
If we can intervene at the earliest stage of someone's development and provide them with a well-rounded education, then it can have positive effects on their attitudes to people later in life when they are actually entering into the world of work. In responding to a Scottish Government consultation recently, the National Day Nurseries Association said this. Early identification and intervention is essential to eliminating violence and its negative consequences in women and children's lives. It is vital that services that come into daily contact with women and children and young people are able to identify those at risk and offer an appropriate, safe and consistent response. And I think, I, well, I actually agree with this. Childcare providers and teachers are in a unique position to influence each child at a critical stage of their development. They can identify if things aren't right at home, they can help children understand what's wrong or on topics such as gender stereotypes and violence. This can develop children's attitudes and have a positive effect on how they treat other people when they're older. So it's crucial that the best support is available to children at this early stage. In closing, I welcome this year's 16 Days of Activism campaign to reduce gender-based violence in the workplace. I back the steps being taken across the UK in challenging the climate in which we live and work to ensure that these kind of instances are not allowed to happen and will not be tolerated anymore. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call Angela Constance, the last speaker in the open debate. Then we obviously move to closing speeches. Ms Constance, please. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, while aspects of this debate uh, are often depressing, as uh, highlighted by Kezia Dugdale, it is uh, nonetheless always a, a privilege to participate in what has become uh, an annual debate in this Parliament, the debate on the, the global 16 days of activism uh, to end gender-based violence. But ending violence against women and girls at home and abroad is not just a campaign for Christmas. It's a systematic and sustained effort uh, all year round, uh, given, as the Minister highlighted, that no institution, environment or space is immune. And that's why Scotland's equally safe strategy, our ambition, and our equally safe delivery plan, what we do, is so important. Because equally safe is important because of its breadth and depth, rightly recognising that to end gender-based violence, you need to tackle the root causes of the imbalance of power between men and women and the wider impact of inequality across our society, where only half the population are invited or included. And we must always recognise that rape, sexual assault, murder and all forms of domestic violence are ultimately driven by beliefs. They are not driven by emotions. Men don't lose control or snap or become provoked. The root cause is insidious accepted misogyny, the sexist remarks and the objectification of women. And to challenge behaviours, we need always to challenge beliefs. And I was very encouraged when the Cabinet Secretary for Justice said rather eloquently, uh, in my view, that we must guard against a pervasive misogyny which unchecked impacts on the wider health, well-being and safety of our communities, breeding a culture where this type of harm is tolerated, sometimes even condoned, as a result is allowed to continue. And I very much look forward to the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, his uh, deliberations uh, and how we reform uh, our criminal law, how that can be strengthened uh, to combat misogyny, uh, particularly as he takes forward uh, the work that we'll do in this Parliament on hate crime. And we've heard uh, throughout this afternoon how misogyny can seep into public policy uh, and even our own Parliament. And it was a, a pivotal moment, a watershed moment, uh, when this Parliament passed the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act, creating specific offence of domestic abuse that covered psychological and emotional maltreatment and coercive and controlling behaviour, as well as physical attacks. Because in my view, as a former prison-based social worker, this was absolutely crucial. Because having an accurate picture of the nature of any crime, having the nature of the offence uh, and conviction recorded accurately is absolutely crucial to both challenging and changing the behaviour of perpetrators. 
And as a feminist, I'm absolutely committed uh, to the rehabilitation of offenders who are largely uh, male. Uh, and therefore, it is good to see the expansion uh, of the Caledonian programme as detailed uh, in the Equality Minister's uh, Progress Report. And it's actually never left me uh, the work that I did uh, with men, uh, some of whom were very dangerous, some of whom uh, were very disturbed. Uh, be that the work around parole reports uh, or risk assessments that ultimately uh, limited uh, the freedoms and choices uh, that these men could take with regards to their own future. But what also never uh, leaves me is that some of the uh, most disturbed and dangerous men that I worked with had experiences uh, or indeed had childhoods that would make <coughs> you weep. Now, that is never an excuse. Individuals uh, will always be responsible for their behaviour and choices. And my job as a prison-based social worker was often to get offenders to be able to accept and understand that, to accept that their history uh, was not their destiny. But it does bring into sharp focus the need for the work that is now being done on adverse childhood experiences, given the equally safe places and increased priority upon prevention, stopping the violence from occurring in the first place. And I want to pay tribute to Rape Crisis uh, and their sexual violence reduction programme that's taking place uh, in schools for the work that they're doing to increase uh, the understanding of consent uh, and healthy relationships. And I also, uh, like others, very much look forward uh, to meeting our Everyday Heroes project uh, again uh, this uh, Thursday afternoon. To conclude, presiding officer, in my view, one of the biggest gains of this parliament is the consensus that's been built up over the years around the analysis, the strategy and the action that we need to take to end violence against women and girls in all its forms. That doesn't mean that we have or will agree on everything. It doesn't mean we should ever for a moment be complacent and we need to diligently shed a light on the good, bad and indifferent. But it does make for strong foundations to continue uh, our work together, our work to end violence against women and girls and to make Scotland uh, a safer place for everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll call Rhoda Grant, Pros for Labour. Ms Grant, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, this has been a really interesting debate. I think everyone <coughs> agreed that more must be done to combat violence against women, putting in place, I think, a growing list of actions that we must take to address it. And I think central to the debate was equality, equality in power, equality in access to finance, and equality in esteem. And if we don't have those, we will never eradicate violence against women. So we need to continually work on things that put that right. A lot of the debate was about sexual harassment. The Me Too campaign was mentioned by many people and that was not surprising. I think um, Kezia Dugdale gave voice to, I think, what we all felt about the anonymous survey that was carried out in this parliament. I think we all really expected better from this workplace. We should be leading and shouldn't be allowing the kinds of behaviour highlighted in that survey to occur. Um, and I was one of the people I, I should declare an interest on the sexual harassment working group. And those were some of the issues we were trying to address as part of that working group. And Kezia talked about anonymous reporting that would trigger investigation eventually if there was a, a course of conduct and behaviour that was being highlighted by an in, did, individual. And sometimes the responses to that questionnaire would suggest that there were some individuals that were constantly perpetrating and abusing their power. And I think we need to deal with that. Um, Annie Wells talked about the culture of respect workshops and um, how we need to change the culture in this parliament um, and indeed the bystander culture to encourage people to come forward and tackle this abuse where they see it happening. Um, it is a, 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 an imbalance in power and a, male, and a male culture that causes a lot of this, um, as Maury, Maurice Corey pointed out. But not always. We wouldn't say that this, this parliament had a male culture and yet it goes on under the radar and we're not picking it up. 
And sexual harassment in the workplace equates to sexual exploitation because it's a trade of sex for career progression or maybe on the other end of the spectrum for work at all when your boss has control over your zero hours contract you are in a very difficult position if that person wants to abuse that power because you may not be able to work so violence against women is the power imbalance and make it it makes work and money tools for harassment and ex exploitation and um, Alison Harris and indeed Kezia Dugdale mentioned the fear of reporting and the impact that that would have on the individual reporting. But the perpetrators play on that. They know <coughs> that people have that fear and therefore will not report. And we, I think, have to do something about that to make sure that fear no longer exists and we protect those that are reporting um, that harassment. A number of people talked about the justice system, um, John Finney, Sandra White, um, Angela Constance um, and others. Um, I think we need to pay credit to Police Scotland. If the instigation of Police Scotland did one thing, it was actually to change the police's attitude to domestic abuse. Um, since its inception, they have taken action um, to deal with domestic abuse. And there are still pockets within the police service that require improvement, but I think they have put the checks and balances in place that make um, it much more easy to, to report domestic abuse. And I think this is then, we're seeing the, the, the benefits of that in that we're having more reporting. The judicial system as well has improved, but they have a lot further to go. And we need to look at our laws to see if we can make further improvements to help people through that system, the making of statements, the court process and the like. Things like forensic examinations that Liam MacArthur talked about. It was unacceptable that people from Orkney and Shetland had to go off island. Um, sometimes in the clothes they were wearing when they were attacked, in fact most of the time in the clothes they were wearing when they were attacked, um, to have those forensic examinations. And we need to make sure that wherever you live in Scotland you have the same access to justice as anywhere else. And uh, Claudia Beamish talked about those additional issues for women in rural areas, not just the access to justice, but also the access to escape routes, to transport, to finance. And I think it was quite moving also to listen to Angela Constance talk about her experience as a prison social worker, talking about some of the people that are perpetrating that abuse and how we address that behaviour using things like the Caledonian Project. I think that's really important, but we have to address that behaviour much earlier on. We have to ingrain in our children, our young boys, our young girls, that this is unacceptable. And also in the media, and I welcome um, the work that has been done through the media um, to stop the imbalance in their reporting. It, often very sexist reporting of what happens um, in our society. The violence against women, I think we all agree, is, is actually a problem of men's violence against women. That's why our cross-party group is called Men's Violence Against Women and Children. And, and it's good to hear of men taking forward this, making it their, their duty and their understanding that they need to change this um, this idea that men find it acceptable that they should abuse women. People talked about the many organisations that do this, White Ribbon, um, um, Scottish Women's Aid, Rape Crisis, Zero Tolerance, Women's Support Project were all mentioned. Um, I, I join in congratulating them and indeed the individuals, the people that spoke, the woman that spoke to James Dornan and indeed Fiona and Germaine Druitt who work um, despite their own problems and issues to try and stop this happening to other people. We need to make progress against violence against women because there's much to do. We need to build a society that supports and values women and treats them equally. And as I close, I would just make a plea to the Scottish Government to use all their powers to protect women from the excesses of the UK welfare state that ingrains that inequality. Thank you. And can I remind all members to have their mobile phones silent? I don't want to hear jingles. Don't start pointing at people. It doesn't become you. You could be guilty next time, Mr. Lyle. I call on Liam Kerr, please, to close the Conservatives. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I greatly appreciate the opportunity to close today's debate for the Scottish Conservatives. On the one hand, because it is right that we 
visibly and unitedly welcome the global 16 days of activism against gender-based violence with this year's theme to end gender-based violence in the world of work. It is imperative that we publicly commend the many activists and organizations, both in Scotland and across the world, that are providing frontline support for survivors and raising awareness. But also because this has been an extremely moving and powerful debate with strong contributions from members right across the chamber. Many highlighting, as Rhoda Grant opened by saying, that whilst we are right to reflect on how far we've come, we must be absolutely aware of how far we have still to go when it comes to eradicating gender-based violence. And Maurice Corrie gave us a pithy summary of what this is about when he said, violence against women and girls is inexcusable and should never be condoned. It cannot have a place in our society nor any community worldwide. Presiding officer, isn't it shocking that it should be necessary to actually have a specific day of activism to end violence against women and girls. But as we have heard, sadly it is. Because we've heard throughout this debate some absolutely shocking statistics which bear repeating. 60,000 incidents of domestic violence in Scotland. 137 women killed by their partner or family member every day. 71% of all human trafficking victims are women and girls. And 37 countries worldwide still exempt rape perpetrators from prosecution if they are married to or eventually marry the victim. Now, various members raised the horror of female genital mutilation. Maurice Corrie cited research which suggests that as many as 170,000 girls in the UK have undergone female genital mutilation. I was reading something earlier. Julie Bindell thinks, however, it is much higher. As UN women have said, at least 200 million women and girls alive today have undergone this mutilation and the majority of girls were cut before they were even five. Now in 2015 the UK government introduced in England and Wales and Northern Ireland uh, female genital mutilation protection orders, a mandatory reporting duty, lifelong anonymity and a criminal offence of failing prote to protect your own daughter. And just on Friday the 23rd of November there, the UK announced it would make the largest single investment ever to end FGM worldwide by 2030, an extra 50 million pounds. And we must see action on this now from the Scottish Government as well. The SNP's programme for government 2018-19 rightly committed to bringing forward a female genital mutilation bill. So perhaps the Cabinet Secretary will update the Chamber on this in closing. And the Chamber was clear that there is still a persistent problem with domestic abuse. James Dornan spoke particularly powerfully and compellingly. Much of what he said was very difficult, but it was absolutely right that it is heard. Statistics today show domestic violence is on the rise for the second year in a row. Last year, the police dealt with over 163 domestic violence calls each day but only 44% of those resulted in a crime or offence being recorded. And again, to pick up a point that James Dornan made, 82% of incidents had a female victim and a male accused. Now, Rona Mackay was absolutely right to highlight efforts that this parliament has made, including the Domestic Violence Act. And I was pleased to hear Sandra White reference the Solicitor General for Scotland, Alison de Rolo QC, who spoke just this morning. Uh, on how lawyers and judges need to be given specialist training on how to implement and use the new laws on domestic abuse. But as we've heard, there is so much more to be done. On which note, John Finney flagged a link between victim blaming and domestic abuse. And I just want to uh, put this to Parliament, that unlike in England, where it was reformed about a decade ago, we still have a defence of provocation in Scotland, such that if a man murders his wife for her infidelity, he can plead that defence. And assuming the reaction was sufficiently proximate, the crime will be reduced to culpable homicide. Now, whilst that is not gendered in law, I would suggest respectfully it is frequently a gendered issue. And a number of commentators are suggesting that this area needs to be looked at for reform. And again, uh, if the Cabinet Secretary were able to uh, give his views in closing, I would appreciate it. Now, many members offered some solutions, and indeed, Maurice Corey was clear that he said 16 days of activism against gender-based violence are not just simply to raise awareness, but rather to propel us to action and to necessary change. 
Many speakers suggested that prevention is key in our policies, in our workplaces, in our schools and our communities. This is fundamental. Margaret Mitchell referred to the submissions from Zero Tolerance, whose view that education is key to prevention to make both girls and boys aware that certain attitudes and behaviour towards women are unacceptable. Uh, presiding officer, I have only six minutes, isn't that correct? Thank you. Well, in conclusion then, presiding officer, I'm pleased to join Parliament to welcome the 16 days of activism against gender-based violence. The motion is right to flag that we must stand together with the many activists and organisations, both in Scotland and across the world, to raise awareness, to challenge underlying attitudes and inequalities that perpetuate violence against women and girls, and above all, to send a clear message that violence against women and girls is never acceptable. It is not, it never has been, and it must never be. We all have a responsibility to challenge harassment and abuse, and we will do all we can to build a Scotland where everyone can live equally safely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kern. I call Hamza Yusuf to close the Government. Cabinet Secretary, please, eight minutes. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. I think today's debate uh, has been incredibly powerful. Uh, I think the contributions have been incredibly insightful. And I really want to thank all of those who have contributed towards the debate, who have given me a lot to think about, uh, and, and the government uh, a lot to think about, but also the very consensual way uh, in which members across the chamber have, uh, are, are uniting uh, in order to tackle uh, this really uh, important issue of tackling violence uh, against women. Can I also uh, thank the many uh, individuals who have shared their life story or the life story of a loved one uh, in order to highlight the pervasiveness of, of violence against women uh, in our society and pay particular tribute because I, I know uh, they're in the gallery to, to Fiona and Jermaine uh, Drewey who have told the story uh, of their daughter Emily. Anybody who has read uh, just some of the snippets of some of the text messages uh, that Emily received uh, will, will be haunted I think uh, and, and again a, a stark reminder uh, of how pervasive this is uh, in our society. The 16 Days of Activism is an opportunity to champion progress already made, uh, celebrate the accomplishments of those who work tirelessly day in and day out, but also uh, the 16 Days of Activism is a moment uh, or, or, or a period for us to recommit ourselves to tackling uh, this issue. It was only months ago that this chamber voted unanimously to pass the Domestic Abuse Scotland Act 2018. I suspect for many of us that were in the chamber at the time, it will be a debate uh, and a stage three debate and a vote that will stay in our minds for a long, long time. I remember how emotional that was. I remember my, my predecessor, the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, how emotional it was for him. But particularly, I think all of us will remember the reaction of, of, of the women uh, in the gallery. Certainly, I think it was a really historic moment in our, in, in our history of devolution. Uh, but of course, this act, this, this act uh, as we know, will strengthen the law in relation to domestic abuse by making coercive and controlling behaviour a criminal offence. Uh, and a reflection of the reality of domestic abuse. And, and on that reality of domestic abuse, I know some members have touched upon some of the statistics uh, today that have come out uh, and, and released as official statistics. Uh, worth saying that, uh, of course, we know uh, women are by far uh, the victims of, of domestic abuse, uh, four out of five. But also worth mentioning one of the statistics that came out today that 88% um, of those incidents took place, took place in the home, in the home or dwelling where that should be a place of sanctuary uh, for the rest of us. It is a place of sanctuary for most of us. But for these women uh, that, 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 that suffered this domestic abuse, it was a, it was a place of hell. It was a, it was a place where, where they suffered uh, the most unimaginable uh, violence uh, and, and abuse. Um, I want to make sure that we all send a very clear message, regardless of what our government portfolios are, regardless of what, uh, what, what, what our interests are in this parliament, that we all work together to send a very clear message that domestic abuse will simply not be tolerated. Uh, and we will deal with it uh, under the law. The law is one part of uh, this uh, important uh, uh, tools that we have in our toolkit to fight uh, domestic abuse and violence against women. Education is another part, and I will come uh, to that uh, as well. In terms of the act, a, a couple of members asked uh, progress on, on, on the Domestic Abuse uh, Act and, and the enforcement uh, of that act uh, and the commencement uh, of that act. Uh, it will be fully commenced by, by spring uh, next year. The reason for that, uh, as, as many members know, of course, is to allow the police uh, to, to be trained, uh, others to be trained uh, in relation to the new um, provisions within the act uh, and also hopefully to give us time to prepare an awareness and public awareness campaign 
uh, as well, which we'll do uh, in coordination with the many good organisations uh, that lead uh, on this uh, issue. Um, however, domestic abuse is, is only one form of violence against women in this whole spectrum of behaviours. The theme of this year's campaign is end gender-based violence in the world of work. I thought some of the contributions were extraordinarily powerful, at Kezia Dugdales in particular, extraordinarily powerful uh, around the world uh, of work and the challenges that we have to face up to in this parliament, uh, but of course anybody listening or watching, the challenges uh, that, they have to, uh, that they have to face uh, in their place of work is simply not something that we should sit back, uh, that we should condone and that we should just accept uh, as that is uh, the way it has to be. It simply does not uh, have to be uh, that way at all. Harassment is not a specific, uh, it's not a problem specific to any one institution. Uh, it is the responsibility of all society as individuals to take action. But on that, I want to pay tribute to, to, to a really excellent speech I thought by James Dornan, uh, in particular on this point, that as men, we have to face up to the fact that we are the problem. Not all of us, by any stretch of the imagination, nobody's suggesting that. But certainly men and their behaviour, toxic masculinity uh, as part of it, we are the problem. But also equally, we can help to be part of the solution. And that is what 16 Days of Activism uh, tries to reinforce, and I think tries to reinforce uh, very well. And I would say to any, any, any man uh, who doubts uh, how difficult uh, it is, I think, to, to be a woman in, in this society, in our society, in 2018. Just talk to your, talk to your sisters, as I have done. Talk to your wife or your partner. Talk to your daughters. Talk to your mothers. Uh, talk, talk to any woman that is in your life, and just ask them: Has there, you know, some of the challenges, the sexism, the misogyny, uh, the harassment that they've had to, 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 to deal with? And I promise you, it won't be a short conversation. I'm afraid it will be a long conversation. Some things that us men probably were never aware. I was never aware of the fact that when I talked to my, to my sister, uh, that she, uh, every time she walks down the street and it's dark, she holds her keys. She holds her keys. And I said that to, to a couple of my colleagues and all of them said, yep, we all do that. We all do that. And that's the kind of society that we live in. And we should be, as men, we should be utterly ashamed of the fact that through our, again, toxic masculinity, through our actions, uh, that women feel the need that they, uh, they feel the need to, to take such actions. They don't feel, they don't feel safe uh, in their own home uh, and in their own uh, society. I'm very conscious uh, of time, uh, presiding officer. I'm really keen to try to address some of the issues uh, and answer some of the questions uh, that uh, many members uh, raised uh, with me in the chamber. A couple of members in the Conservatives, uh, Annie Wells and Liam Kerr in particular, asked for an update uh, in relation to female uh, genital mutual, uh, mutilation. I won't go into to everything that we've done, but in terms of the actual uh, potential legislative framework, um, the, uh, we have a consultation that opened on the 4th of October. The consultation closes on the 4th of January. Uh, I'm sure uh, they, and, they and others will, uh, of course, uh, respond to that consultation. Uh, once that consultation is closed, of course, we'll come back to update the Parliament uh, on, on taking that forward. We are very committed uh, to taking forward uh, legislation uh, on that uh, front and further action uh, very much uh, on uh, that front. Uh, in terms of one or two other questions that were raised uh, in the Chamber, John Finney, uh, I can confirm that uh, as part of uh, Equally Safe Delivery Plan, uh, very much uh, we work with key justice partners uh, to provide training to sheriffs, uh, to, to, to others right throughout the justice system, professionals that work throughout the justice system, uh, so that trauma-informed responses are embedded throughout. But what I'd like to say to, to John Finney and others uh, is that I have met enough victims uh, of sexual offences, harassment, uh, rape, to understand that from the moment that a terrible incident takes place, right the way through from the police investigation to the court trial, if, the, if it ever gets to court, of course, uh, the court trial, uh, the potential imprisonment of an offender, and then the release of that offender, there's undoubtedly gaps uh, in, in that. And, and the Victims Task Force, which I announced, will look specifically at sexual offences, uh, and specifically at rape as part uh, of the work uh, that it does. Can I thank Lee MacArthur for uh, acknowledging the work that my predecessor uh, had done uh, on, on forensic uh, medical uh, examinations, the work that we're committed to do. Uh, I will come back to him in relation to specific questions around Orkney, uh, but I think we've got a long way to do, but I commend, um, a, a long way to go, but I commend the work of uh, Dr. Catherine Calderwood uh, in this regard and the task force uh, and the work that she is uh, taking forward. Um, a couple of uh, one or two members, I can't remember specifically who asked about uh, protective orders or emergency banning orders uh, as well. Uh, and in our programme for government, we did say we would consult on this uh, at the end of the year. And we are 
hurtling towards the end of the year, but the, the, the plan is still to get that consultation out uh, before uh, Christmas. Um, in, in terms of uh, one or two other issues, uh, Angela Constance asked about the, the government's plans in relation to misogyny. I'm sure she's seen our, our consultation on hate crime. There, there, there is uh, a section there asking for the views uh, of uh, people uh, and organisations on that specifically. I will listen to what uh, people have to say on how to tackle misogyny. It may well be that actually we look at tackling it out with uh, the hate crime framework. It may be more sensible to do so, but I'll reserve judgment on that. I'm due to meet in gender uh, and a number, number of other organisations actually very shortly to discuss uh, this issue uh, with them, but I, I, I keep a very, very open mind uh, to, to, to all of that um, as well. Uh, I, I just want to also touch upon the point uh, raised by Kezia Dugdale uh, around a public awareness campaign. Uh, she gave uh, a lot of food for thought for me to, uh, and the government to reflect on. Uh, we are planning to do a public awareness campaign in spring 2019, so I'll perhaps come back to her to hear her thoughts in a little bit more detail, perhaps as a way of engaging uh, the, the, the cross-party group and asking them their thoughts in advance uh, of spring 2019 to help us to inform uh, what that public awareness campaign should look like, as well as, of course, uh, consulta consultation uh, with the regular stakeholders uh, Rape Crisis Scotland, Scottish Women's Aid, uh, and Gender Zero Tolerance, uh, and many, uh, many more, I'm sure, uh, as, as well. Uh, Liam Kerr asked uh, around uh, the issue of provocation as a mitigation. I have to say, this one came to my attention extraordinary, uh, extremely uh, recently. I, I was astounded uh, at, at what I heard, much like he was uh, as well. I, I don't have an answer for him other than I'm going back to look at it. And of course, I'll, I'll keep him uh, updated. I think it is an issue that is worthy of, uh, of, of examination uh, in terms of legal uh, reform. Uh, it's been a really excellent debate, uh, presenting officer. I'm aware uh, that I, I'm at the very uh, end of my time. We'll continue to do what we can, uh, not just in these 16 days, uh, but of course throughout our time in government to make sure that the violence against women uh, is a thing of the past and, and, and we will work collaboratively uh, with those across the chamber to achieve that end. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on Hear Me Too. Uh, we move on to the next item of business, which is a statement from Edward Mountain, convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, making an announcement on the committee's inquiry into salmon farming in Scotland. Thank you, presiding officer, and I'd like to refer members to my register of interest. But I speak today as the convener of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee, and I'd like to announce the publication today of our report into salmon farming in Scotland. This in-depth inquiry was launched earlier this year. We took evidence from a wide range of stakeholders, research bodies, environmental organizations, regulatory bodies, as well as from the industry itself. The salmon farming industry offers significant economic and social value to Scotland, providing jobs and investment in rural areas. And there is a desire within the industry to grow. However, if this is to happen, it is essential that the serious challenges it faces, such as the control of sea lice, lowering fish mortality rates, and reducing the sector's impact on the environment are addressed as a priority. Our report, presiding officer, contains 65 recommendations how this should be achieved. The committee's strong view is that the status quo in terms of regulation and enforcement is not acceptable. We believe we need to raise the bar in Scotland. All compliance policy must be robust and enforceable at, with appropriate penalties for those operators who don't believe the standard. The committee is clear that no expansion should be permitted at sites where high mortality or significant levels of sea lice are addressed to the satisfaction of regulators. In terms of the environmental impact, the committee noted SEPA's research recent research and concluded that medicine from Scottish salmon farms is significantly impacting local marine environments. The committee therefore is in no doubt that effective regulation of medicine used by farm salmon industry is also a key requirement. The committee makes several recommendations on the siting of salmon farms which need to be read and considered with all the other recommendations in this holistic report. We do hope the report will be welcomed by the industry and initial indications are that it is being so, and other stakeholders as a helpful and constructive document. Presiding officer, we look forward to receiving the Scottish Government's response to our recommendations and a full debate on the report in the Chamber in the new year. Thank you.
Thank you very much. And we turn now to decision time, and there is only one question to be put today. The question is that motion 14904, in the name of Christina McKelvey, on Hear Me 2, 16 days of activism to end violence against women and girls, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll move now to members' business, in the name of Edward Mountain, on the investigation into bullying claims at NHS Highland. We'll just take a few moments for members and the Minister, in fact, to change seats.